to the uh, the questions the question box and we'll see that and see gel our uh, moderator will be able to to help you out with that so I'm assuming people can still hear me because everything's gone silent look just before we start I would like to um, give people a brief introduction about Health Consumers New South Wales. Um, we're expecting uh, nearly 90 people today, which is fantastic and very exciting for us. We're a pick group for Health Consumers in New South Wales, founded in 2010, and part of our main mission is to help provide good quality information for health consumers around how to influence the health sector and also good training and good evidence-based information to people working in health services around how to improve and ensure consumer engagement in the work that you're doing. And we're really excited today to be able to present this model of consumer and community participation to you. Um, many of you will hopefully have seen um, this that I'm waving around which uh, was emailed out to people in the uh, with the information for the webinar which brings together the model that Serena's helped us put together and before we start I do also want to acknowledge um, the support of Went West, the Western Sydney Medicare Local now the Primary Health Network in Western Sydney um, for their support and help and partnership in developing this project. Um, and in particular, I'd like to thank uh, Walter Kemmett, their CEO. Uh, Walter was um, unfortunately can't be with us today, but his support um, has meant so much to getting the project together and completing what I think is a really fantastic um, model that you'll hear about shortly. And also the other colleagues out at Went West, Michelle Warwick, Rachel Barker and Donna Sedgman who have all contributed um, and supported uh, the, the, the project and our consumer representatives who we couldn't have um, put anything together without, in particular Alison Kakani and John Leadon. Thanks both of you for your help with all of this. So look, as I said, there'll be room for questions as uh, we, get, we come along. Please put questions and comments into the box um, as we proceed. And I'll now hand over to Serena to, um, for the bulk of the, the webinar. So thank you, Serena. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, welcome, everyone. I know there's a number of people that I already know who are attending and also uh, plenty of people that, are, that I haven't met yet. So I really appreciate uh, that you've come along, that you've registered today. The first thing that I'd like to do is to actually ask you to participate in a poll because I think it's useful for, for us but it's useful for you as well to know the makeup of who is actually attending. So if you could participate in this short poll and our moderator Sigel is, uh, is setting that up. So please use your mouse to click on you're participating today as an interested consumer or a consumer representative or consultant or health services staff or health policy staff or researcher and academic. And that, that will just be useful information uh, to know who, who's the audience. This model is, is probably very much a tool for health services, uh, but it is also a tool for consumer representatives. And I'll talk at the end about some of the ways that a consumer representative can use this model in part of their uh, representation, in part of their work. So we've got some results coming through. Uh, so we've got 8% consume, interested consumers, 19% consumer rep or consultant, 54% health services staff, and 19% health policy staff. So thank you everyone for, for participating in that and coming along. I'm going to give you a, an outline uh, of the webinar today and the, it, I'm going to give an introduction, a short introduction, but also talk about why we engage. I won't delve too deeply into that, but I do want to touch on it. And in the section uh, that addresses the model, we introduce it in, in three stages. In the first stage, I talk about the key concepts that are at the heart of the model and there's three of those. 
and in the centre we talk about the evidence and the best practice that actually underpins the model and there are six strategies that we've identified that are that really roll up those that evidence and best practice and then talk about the model in its entirety and what the different elements actually relate to. Um, finally we'll talk about some of the ways that you could use the model either as a consumer or as a as health services staff and finally there'll be time for questions um, that Anthony will moderate at the end of the towards the end of the session. So Anthony mentioned that this uh, project, this model, is a, an outcome of a joint project, and it was a project that was set up between Health Consumers New South Wales and Went West, who were at that time the Medicare Local and are now the Primary Health Network. And the aims of the joint project essentially were to to work within Went West to embed consumer involvement across Went West, but also to develop tools and resources for use across New South Wales. And we've been very proud to be to launch. We launched the model um, at a Networking Health New South Wales forum uh, at the be beginning of June, and um, we're continuing to promote the model and, and share it. So we like to see see it get out there into the public domain. There's quite a bit of back, back up information for the model and I first want to let you know that there, there is actually a, a detailed report with references that uh, really pulled together best practice and evidence that, that we've looked at to develop the model and that report is now available online uh, and we've provided links within this presentation and you'll get emailed the links afterwards. So if anyone wants to really dig into what's behind it and find out more, that would be the place to go. You've probably you've seen uh, a PDF that was sent out with the registrations for this webinar and that's got a four page brochure essentially to, that's quite useful for sharing the model. That can be quite a useful um, artifact to actually give others that you work with um, information about, about, the, about the model. And, Contained within the centre of that brochure is the model itself as a as a A3 poster. But we've also got a link to that as a poster itself. So those links I've provided here and again at the end of the presentation. So before we really get started, I want to put a, a bit of a caveat on the model. Uh, you may see have seen this. It's it's something that's popped up over the internet at different times and I'm sure many of us will be familiar with the concept that, that is behind it. We never, success is never a straight line, so difficult things, um, it's tempting to make them appear simple and straightforward, but we, in actual fact we know they're not. They're quite complex and really consumer and community engagement is, is actually quite hard to do well. Uh, it's at least meaningful and effective engagement is definitely hard to do well, but we know it's really worth doing. It's a powerful and valuable um, tool in health, in delivery of health, and the evidence shows that health consumer engagement is worth doing. So we can't neatly package it into boxes, but what we do believe is that it's, it is so valuable that it's worth being very clear about definitions, and it's worth getting really specific about what we're talking about, what can be achieved, and how it can be achieved, and that's really what we're trying to do with this model. And while we've we've had some, we got the designers to help us make it look attractive, so that it was it was um, easy to use and easy to look at. But we also want to get the message across that we don't see this as a completely finished product, and we know it's actually going to evolve. So we're still quite interested in your feedback and where people take it and what you do, what you end up doing with the model. So looking at well, why we engage, and there is quite a bit of information on this. Uh, in the model, in the report. But really the rationale for consumer engagement comes down to a number of areas and one is ethics and human rights and democracy. A second is actually improving the outcomes of the health service that is being, that, that the engagement is around. A third is actually developing relationships with um, partners in, in provision or also partners in consumers and the, consu the community that that we're actually working with and of course they're serving a strategic or a political purpose as well. Now they're the different reasons that, that will be given at different times for why 
actually do consumer and community engagement. But I want to actually pose the question differently and I want to ask you, what is the objective of consumer and community engagement? So if you have an, a community engagement or consumer engagement program, either in your health service or that you're participating in it as a consumer, what's going to be different as a result of those programs? What's actually going to change as a result of those programs? We believe that actually consumer-centred care is the objective of the primary objective of consumer and community engagement. And if, if engagement is not improving consumer-centred care in some way, then it isn't really being totally effective. And we're also, we're also using the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare definition for consumer-centred care. And that is healthcare that's respectful of and responsive to the preferences, needs and values of patients and consumers. So now, beginning to look at the model, what did we take into account? Well, we looked at the evidence in the literature. We looked at the latest research, including uh, research based in Sydney, uh, in um, local health districts and consumer engagement at Southwestern Sydney local health districts. We also looked at the industry best, best practice and the literature around that. We looked at the context for Went West as a Medicare local initially, based in Western Sydney, with a, a large and very diverse population. And also we looked at the general transition to primary health networks and what that meant for engagement. But we absolutely also took into account the consumer perspective. And I do also want to thank um, Alison Kakani, who's a, an employed consumer consultant at Went West. And she, her the consumer insights were invaluable throughout the development of this project. So in talking about the model, there are three key concepts that we wanted to introduce. I've talked about improving consumer-centred care and saying that that really has to be recognised as the objective of our engagement. We also wanted to talk about top-down engagement and we described that as partnering with consumers to design new or improve existing services. And also we talk about a broader kind of engagement or ground-up engagement and see that as partnering with communities to better understand the gaps and the access issues and any unmet health needs. So what do we mean by those terms? Well, top-down engagement, we really recognise that there's a whole range of engagement that's, that's going to be driven by health services or health policy development. It's going to be service focused. It, it may very well and most likely be initiated by the services. It's probably looking at the known health needs and it's also looking at the existing or the planned services. And this, for example, could be co-designing a new service, consulting with consumers on the appropriate material to give to consumers and community. It can also mean involving consumers in the evaluation of the service. I've got a great case study of uh, a feature story here of uh, one that, um, an example of top-down engagement that was being run out of Went West and it also features um, our consumer partner Alison Kakani. And this is being run out of the Western Sydney Partners in Recovery project uh, program and that is a program that really provides support for people who have persistent and severe mental illness and usually have quite very complex needs. And it's also a partner, it works in partnership with a consortium of service providers where Went West um, is actually the, the lead and the coordinator but works through other service providers. This is a really good example where consumers have been involved in service evaluation. So it's an existing service and it needs to be evaluated. Now, this is also a great example and I like it because it isn't just run by the health service because in fact there's a consumer consultant running this evaluation and that's Alison. So that's, her, that's Alison, that's her role, she's on the right hand side of that photo. She developed a client survey with input from her consumer and carer forum and this is a survey for clients who are either with the program or have completed the program. Now the postal survey wasn't particularly effective so they hired uh, Bronnie who's a consumer herself 
and she administers that survey by, by phone and they've actually got a really good re response rate now um, running that, um, that survey. They're, the partners in recovery team are now using that data not only to report to the funding body but also to work with the service providers in the consortium to improve service delivery. But importantly, if, if in talking to a client through that survey they actually uncover a problem for that particular client, they make sure it actually gets addressed without delay. So it's a lovely example of a service evaluation that's, that's been initiated by the service but it partners very, very well with consumers to, to run that. So taking back to that other, that third concept we talked about which was ground up engagement, I know a number of you will be quite familiar with what we're talking about here. It's community focused engagement. We think it's important that this can be initiated by communities and that's something to take into account in planning how engagement interfaces with the community in a sense. And it's partnering with communities, it's better understanding their needs, it's developing solutions with communities themselves. And it's going to be looking at where there are service gaps, where there are access problems and any other unmet needs that aren't, perhaps they're not being met, maybe they're not well understood or we haven't figured out the best way to deliver them yet. A lovely example of this out of uh, Went West is Thrive at Five in Doonside and this is a jointly funded, uh, it's jointly funded by Went West and the West and Sydney Local Health District and it's a whole of community programs and it's working with services, it works with parents and community members across the area and the focus is is on children's school readiness skills and, and health of naught to fives and long term health as a result of their school readiness scores. So it's looking at reducing barriers to services that are already there but also identifying fun ways to help children develop school readiness skills. And one thing they did which was terrific was they interviewed parents of children naught to five in the area of Doonside about what they believed were the strengths and the weaknesses and the opportunities for families with young children in the area. And they also invited parents and community members to join the local community partnership group. And they've rolled out some exciting um, programs, quite a number of exciting programs there. And this is a photo from Baby Rhyme Time, which was something that actually went hand in hand with a, a mini top soccer program to get kids. Um, using their social skills, their motor skills and actually really having some fun with their parents around literacy. It's a lovely program and it's still, still working well in Doonside. So there are some examples of uh, top down and ground up engagement. There's obviously many more that we could talk about but just coming back again to those three concepts of consumer centred care, top down engagement and ground up engagement. How do they actually interact? We felt it was really important to identify the way they interact and in identifying that actually being able to, to, uh, to measure it within a, an actual engagement program in the health service. So if we look at what feeds from top down engagement into consumer centred care, really we'd be looking for identifying service improvements and also identifying and bringing the consumer perspective or the consumer journey um, back into care. For example, um, th where there are organisations where at committee meetings or board meetings the consumer story is always shared at the start of the meeting and that's a way of taking valuable insights from that top down engagement and bringing it back into the actual delivery and running of, of healthcare. Looking down at ground up engagement, well what what do we expect is actually provided from ground up engagement into consumer centred care? Well, we would expect there'd be new programs and new needs identified in the community and we'd also expect to identify strategies to reduce barriers to care. There's actually a third one that needs to be added there and that's new partnerships that have developed as a result of that engagement with the community. Partnerships to work with and also to deliver services. It works the other way too. Uh, Top-down engagement relies on um, the actual health care to we need to get consumer experience measurement from the actual health care delivery to feed into engagement processes, particularly into um, evaluation processes. But we also would hope to identify new consumer representatives, perhaps people who've given feedback on a service or had a problem with a service or had a great, had a great experience with a service and they're interested in giving back. 
There are some uh, inputs as well from consumer-centred care back out to uh, partnering with community and ground-up engagement. Probably the most important one is actually raising awareness in the community of the services that are available. There's some opportunity for reporting um, performance to, to the community. But really the most important thing in partnering with community and ground up engagement is actually listening, not telling. So that one's there because it's valuable but it's probably not the most important when it comes to ground up engagement. So there are those three key concepts. And we're going to jump out of model now to talk a little bit about six strategies that are based on evidence. Once again, if you want to drill further into these, they are in more detail in the report. Um, and they're the result of looking at a whole range of barriers and facilitators to consumer engagement. Um, it's also worth noting that on the back of the brochure, the PDF that was emailed out to you, there's a little blue box and that actually lists these six strategies as well. The first is to ensure consumer engagement is a priority. And really this includes involving consumers from the beginning, not halfway through or towards the end. And it means support from senior management for consumer engagement. Um, so and it, that's um, resources as well as actually moral support. And it also it means involving consumers in governance. Secondly, it's, it's essential that, organ, that uh, health services address their own internal organisational facilitators. And we mean by that internal governance, the accountabilities for engagement and where they lie in the organisation, but also in, um, the built-in opportunities for consumers and communities to initiate engagement. So that's how porous is the organisation for, con for communities to say, look, we, we'd actually like to talk to you about a problem that we've got or uh, uh, we've got a problem accessing a service. Third is actively include disadvantaged or marginalised groups. This is a really important one because if we just, if we merrily go along and set up consumer engagement in ways that, that suit us because that's natural, what will tend to happen is we will engage with people a lot like ourselves. And what that means is that we're then not hearing from the voices who are not readily able to engage, the disadvantaged, the marginalised, sometimes they're referred to as hard to reach groups. So if we don't specifically have strategies to, to engage with these groups, and it won't necessarily be bring them onto a committee, um, there'll, there'll be other ways to do it. But if we don't do it, what we actually do is we perpetuate health inequality. So it is a really important one to consider. The fourth strategy is to build the capacity of consumers to engage. This has actually been pretty well recognised and it's really important. It's about providing support and training to consumers. It's actively supporting your consumer reps and that and the work that the, in the work they're doing and that can mean the really practical stuff like making sure they get the printed materials or they have access to a printer um, or they have someone that they can call with, a, with an issue that's just got to be resolved and that there's a coordinator or a facilitator who can on a fairly regular basis debrief with the consumer representative or at least ensure there's a networking opportunity for consumer reps within the organisation to actually debrief with each other. And the flip side of the fourth strategy is to actually build the capacity of staff to support engagement. It is really important for staff to understand and value the role of, of consumers and also to support the staff that are involved in engagement. Have those staff connected up um, perhaps through a community of practice where they can share all the resources that they might need uh, but also share their learning um, talk and, and touch base on the different ways that they've been able to um, get some engagement or even just share um, documents like terms of reference and position descriptions. And six, which is definitely not, it's last but it is not least, and that is to focus on outcomes and evaluation. That means not only measuring consumer experience data, and there is a lot of work um, coming out on this, uh, patient reported um, outcome measures and patient reported experience measures, but it's also, this area also is about evaluating engagement and focusing on the outcome of engagement. So it isn't merely about evaluating the process, but it is, well, what was the impact? 
what impacts did this engagement have? And that actually can't start too early. It's, it's really valuable to actually look at the beginning of an activity, how will this be evaluated, and to incorporate the consumer's view in, in what actually would make a successful activity and involve consumers in evaluating that. So, and finally, it's actually publishing, publishing results, because this has actually only been done in a very patchy way. It does actually hold the field of engagement, consumer and community engagement back a little bit, the fact that there is only limited um, publication, limited uh, research published in the literature around engagement, and we would absolutely encourage everyone here who's involved in engagement programs to consider how you can publish and how, how you can evaluate and how you can publish your work. So that's, I raise these because this is essentially what the model is based on. So I'm now going to talk about all the elements of the model. And uh, if you do have your, if you have happened, happened to have printed out your um, PDF brochure or you've got a brochure with you, you could follow along with this, but I, I've got uh, these slides are optimised for PowerPoint. We've talked about the process, the processes that contribute to consumer-centred care. There are, couple, there are a number of other elements and the first one we wanted to talk about was consumers involved in governance and really that is, that is really essential for to say that consumers are coming first or consumers are a, are a really important part of the organisation and an important part of planning and delivery. Primary, net, net, primary health networks are adopting this in some way with the ad formation of community advisory committees. There are all sorts of different ways that's being done. It's valuable for all those networks to ask what governance role will the consumers play in the primary health network, equally across local health districts. Consumers have played a number of different roles in governance and I know that the, that the national standards have um, required that consumers have some involvement in governance in different ways and I and understand this happens in a, in a variety of levels within different organisations. We certainly recommend that uh, if, you know this is something to always keep in mind, it is actually part of the engagement program. Another foundational element is the guiding principles or values that upon which the entire engagement program is run. Many organisations enshrine these in their engagement frameworks. They give you a frame of reference for the way in which consumers and staff and management all interact with each other and they can be used by um, any party to hold the other party to account. They're quite important. The other um, area of the model, um, and it, may, it relates to three of the elements that are listed, and they're the critical inputs. Uh, we really can't expect to be successful in this unless we put some um, resources and some effort into actually making it happen effectively. And we're recognising here, and, and a lot of these critical inputs do actually relate back to the, the strategies, the six strategies. So we've included internal capacity, uh, partnerships and integration and consumer and community capacity here. Um, internal capacity, again, that's your organisational facilitators and it's the staff having the training and the support to be able to actually um, support the engagement programs that are being undertaken. It's resources, it's funding, it's um, senior management support. Partnerships and integration is an interesting one. Um, people. We, we hear a lot more about um, integrated care for good reason because uh, a person who has an illness uh, is, is one person and they don't really like being split up into various parts of the health system and, and it's quite difficult to understand sometimes. When you're looking at your engagement processes, um, do consumers uh, are they restricted to the area that your health service is working in or is there a possibility that um, primary health and local health districts can actually be quite integrated in the way that you engage with your consumers and community. Thirdly, consumer and capacity, consumer and community capacity. 
this is a pretty important area because you can have a fabulous engagement program ready to go but put an ad out in the paper looking for consumer reps and get a, a handful of, of phone calls from people. Really building up the consumer representatives uh, within an organisation that work with an organisation does require quite a bit of work. It requires building the consumers themselves. Um, consumer reps can come to an organisation with a lot of experience or a small amount of experience or a small amount of representation experience but a lot of life experience or, or other professional experience and it really does require building up, um, building up that capacity, supporting those consumers. A great network of consumer representatives that work with an organisation can actually become uh, support themselves, can begin to support themselves in fact very well. Uh, and um, there's a number of papers that Health Consumers New South Wales has released some, um, put some out in our newsletter about mentoring and we've heard, we heard um, at the Networking Health New South Wales Forum about some terrific examples of um, mentoring, consumers mentoring consumers. Of course, there's also the flip side of the, to balance the whole model, we need key outcomes and we, we of course, we're looking at improved health outcomes in a way that relates directly to the consumer-centred care, to improving consumer-centred care. But we'd also not just look at um, patient health outcomes and experience outcomes, but also improved community outcomes in the sense that there are fewer gaps, um, needs are being identified and needs are being met, and community health could actually uh, improve as a result. But as I've said earlier, evaluating engagement and having evidence of engagement, these are really important outcomes of the engagement processes and engagement programs. Capacity and capability building. So as consumers and health services work together and actually run, um, carry out engagement activities, they each develop more confidence and experience and that, that keeps feeding um, better and better engagement. It improves engagement skill and engagement capability. So these are all part of the outcomes of the engagement process. So that's um, and obviously there's there's a fair bit there. But, um, what we're hoping that the material kind of available to you would read up would like to read up. I certainly encourage anybody who feels they haven't had their that look at that material um, then please do contact us. But yes, I've just taken you through the PowerPoint version. The version I've just shown on the screen, this is the, the poster version or the one that's in the that you'll find in the report and on the in the brochure. So looking just quickly now at possible ways to use the model, I first wanted to actually focus on the way that consumer reps or consumers could use this model because I'm aware that it, it is very much about um, the policies and strategies of an organisation, although some of you will be really familiar with that sort of thing anyway. But we see that this is something that you could use to promote best practice engagement with your health service. For you know, take the model and, and talk to your health service about it. We also think that for any engagement activity that you're part of, you could use this framework, particularly the key outcomes, to say, well, this, out, this activity looks great. How will this contribute to improving care? So it just lit in the screen, it went to sleep for a second. How will this contribute to improving care? How will this activity contribute to improving consumer and community capacity building? And how will it be evaluated? And those are questions that you can ask at the beginning of any engagement activity. And so they're the, they are the key outcomes from the model. The model in its entirety, particularly if you're in a governance role or you're in the position where you, you actually have an input on an organisation whole engagement program. You can use this, um, the, the, the literature review in the report but also the model to critically assess the design and implementation of the engagement program that you're, you're involved in. I hope that you could also use this model to help you to contribute to the evaluation plan of, the, of engagement within the health service that you work with or, or, the, or the policy committee that you're on. And also I'd like, I would like to see that this helps you to be involved in the monitoring and the evaluating of the engagement that you're involved in. And for health services, you could use this to either establish or to review 
your governance for engagement, perhaps review even the role that consumers are playing in um, governance for engagement. Um, you could use it to establish or to review your principles for consumer and community engagement and I would encourage you to do that with your consumer representative. It's definitely something to work on together. You could use the model to review uh, the infrastructure, your critical inputs, how, how well set up are you to actually be able to implement this kind of engagement program, implement the model as we've, as we've shown it. It's certainly possible to start all of this without having every single thing in place, but it's well worth you understanding where you are at with those critical inputs and perhaps have a plan for how you would um, continue putting other things in place that perhaps you don't have. Uh, you could also identify your engagement processes. Is it predominantly top down? Is it ground up? Um, is it a mixture of both? And identify what the inputs are from those engagement processes to consumer-centred care so that you can monitor. You want to be able to monitor the outputs from engagement, the inputs to consumer-centred care and monitor the actual impact so that you can actually report. Well, we our engagement program did these things and we monitored these were the actual direct inputs to consumer centre care and this is the impact that it's had. And it also would be a useful tool to develop an evaluation plan and evaluate the outcomes from across your, evaluate, your, your engagement program. So what we've talked about today, I've given you a brief introduction. We talked about why we engage, particularly what is the objective of engagement. We've looked at the model. There are three key concepts that are at the heart of the model. There are six key strategies that underpin it. There are the full model is actually 11 elements in the full model. I've just briefly talked about possible ways to use the model and we'd love to hear from you about what you think are ways to use the model and we're going to have time for questions in a moment. But I really want to get this message across. Please do use the model and publish. Please talk about, publish your results, present them at conferences, definitely look at getting them into uh, the journal. But we, we do encourage you to adapt and modify the model. It's a starting point and it's not an end point. More links, we'll provide those again at the end for the full model, uh, the poster and the brochure. So the, this is the model that we've given it to you today. I hope that before too long that it looks something like taking time to load. I hope before too long it can look something like this. Please use it, scribble on it, have it stuck up next to your um, computer on your desk, make it a talking point. We really encourage you. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll hand back to Anthony now for questions and I'll leave, I'll leave my links um, up on the screen so that um, that's always available. So I'm just waiting now for um, our moderator to okay. bring no, and Okay, look, thanks, Serena. Um, there's been a couple of questions as we've um, gone through, and one of them's been around um, some timing and how long it takes to actually uh, set up a framework around using the model for an organisation? Um, I think well, that's an interesting question. It's probably a how long is a piece of string question, which is not a, that's not an answer I know. Um, it, you, of course you can get started with engagement by deciding to involve consumers in a forum or a committee, but I think to give this um, entire framework a, a chance. Uh, I can imagine an organisation, while they're getting started, actually spending six months to 12 months actually really thinking about this and, and developing it. But certainly within 12 months of getting started, I'd expect you could have a, um, a framework that, that could be based on this. And uh, but, but yeah, we'll come back to your resources. 
Um, in, in more detail in the report, we talk about the need to have a champion within the organisation, and that's somebody who's a, at the senior level who can influence others across the organisation, and also having a facilitator or a coordinator. And that, that certainly is um, it's people and it's money. And if those things are there, things can move a lot faster. If those things aren't there, it could, it could move a lot slower. Yeah. You definitely need financial commitment. It needs to be something that senior management has committed to um, for, um, for things to move quickly. Yeah. And I think the thing that I'd also add is this is a dynamic model. So yes, it's about establishing processes you know, like Serena's talked about, but I think it's also realising that with engagement, whether it's consumer engagement or community engagement, it's not as though an organisation can think, oh yes, we've arrived, we've done it and we're here. It's about realising that this is a, um, a dynamic process that's ongoing and linked to um, quality improvement processes. So um, again, I don't know if that's a helpful answer or not, but I think it's worth remembering that once it's set up, it's ongoing and should sort of set up its own own feedback loops. Look, we've also had a couple of questions around um, some examples um, around the type of capacity building skills that uh, is needed for both consumers and services. Um, and people are asking for, for examples of that. I suppose, just before I hand back to Serena, that's a great opportunity to let people know and remind people that Health Consumers New South Wales actually provides training and, and support for both consumers and health services. And if people are interested in finding out more about our own training programs, please get in touch with us. But I'd also, um, I suppose, just go back to Serena and ask around um, any particular examples of um, capacity building skills that are needed around helping engagement. Uh, that's another big one. Um, consumers. Um, to start with consumers, uh, to, to view um, consumer representatives that are involved with a, with a health service and um, really in a big health service there can be dozens to, you know, up to a hundred potentially consumer representatives that are involved and it, I, I guess to view the, these people as a credible resource and to actually put back into that resource. So um, do they have a facilitator that they can um, get in touch with if they've got problems? Have they got ways of communicating with each other so they can support each other? Um, are there informal or formal opportunities for consumers to be mentored by experienced consumers? And are there, are, are there ways, have, are there opportunities to actually celebrate and to recognise um, the achievements of the consumer representatives that are involved. I know um, one organisation holds a consumer conference once a year where their networks of consumer representatives come together and uh, present things they've done. I believe there are awards uh, provided and the work of the consumers is recognised to staff as well in newsletters and, um, and in external publications. So that's actually a way of really developing the capacity of, I mean, they're, they're people in a way. It's almost another workforce, but it's a different kind of workforce and it does need these input, resourcing, support. In terms of the capacity of the organisation, it is, it is really important that the skills and um, the know-how to engage with consumers, that it's, it's actually recognised as quite an asset. And that's probably where the role of the consumer, the champion for engagement, that senior person who, who does art, you know, speak out for engagement and champions for it, but also the facilitator. And whether it's a way of, of running a community of practice, having um, a knowledge centre or a knowledge on an intranet, but certainly making and also uh, regularly promoting what the engagement program does particularly promoting the achievements of the engagement program and that then comes back to you need to actually um, measure the achievements, you need to evaluate the engagement so that you can then talk about the contribution that the program's made. 
And right. Serena, just oh, sorry. Yeah, just that, picking that, up on that. So sorry, everybody, but just just picking up on that. Um, once there is a sense of what the achievements have been, um, there's been a question come through around publishing because obviously one of the big things that we all need to do is to build up the evidence and let people know what's working and to publish. Um, and there's been a question about uh, what, what journals would people recommend publishing in. And before I, um, we get to that, I'd also say that as important as publishing in journals is and something we should all try and work towards, publishing in journals isn't the only way to get the evidence out there. And if people have evaluations or report that can, reports that can be made publish and put on websites and things like that, um, that's a fantastic way to get things out. We're in the process here at Health Consumers New South Wales of building up the evidence base. So people can send that to us as well and we'll make sure that's available online as, um, as a way to do that. But um, just Serena, I was also wondering if you had any um, any thoughts around uh, where to publish and sort of good places to look for for that? Um, uh, a couple of things. There are the consumer um, publications such as the Consumers Health Forum of Australia has Health Voices. So that's a, um, that's a publication that comes out. It's it's not a journal, but it's, it's something you can have reports, um, short reports published in. Um, Health Issues Centre Victoria also has a publication, I can't recall its name, but Health Issues Centre Victoria, you can certainly find them on the web. Um, there are also a couple of uh, journals, I believe it's the Australian, the Australian Health Review is a journal on management, health services, health services management. There's also the Australian Primary Health um, Journal of Australian Primary Health Care. So there's there's a number of, out there, but certainly as Anthony says, journals journals will be certainly they're the, the pinnacle, but they're one of the hardest things to to publish in. Um, and there are the other um, uh, reports uh, that come out regularly, organisations that come out from the organisations. And there's another one put out by the Australian. Um, Health and Hospitals Association, um, AHA, put out a, a, a publication um, and that's something else that can, can, it can get into. Conferences, of course, um, and there's a front at the end of the year, but there are others uh, that are appropriate as well. I guess the, yeah. once, once these things, if they're shareable uh, and they, you can, we can get them into the net, it's a learning for everyone. It, 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 so, it, whether it be, yeah. whether it becomes something in the literature or whether it's something that just just actually generates learning across the network, whether it be New South Wales or Australia, it's still it's of great value. Yeah. And look, Health Consumers New South Wales is always um, available if people have questions or want to know where a good place to publish something is. If you can't find anything through your own networks please come back and talk to us and we'll be happy to continue that conversation. Um, and there's another question that's been raised um, around um, someone look, looking for ideas around engaging disadvantaged and marginalised groups, which is, again, another huge question about how we do that and something that we could devote, I suppose, at least another webinar to some down, down the track. Um, I know this is an area that Serena has particular interest in, so realising that in a couple of minutes we're not going to be able to answer all those questions, perhaps Serena you could um, give us some insights about some good places to start there? Well, places to start are uh, actually to look around at who already engages with those consumers in your area and also look at the community organisations in your area. Yeah, some some hard to reach groups. You do need to really exercise some sensitivity. They won't necessarily um, be willing and able to come and engage the way you, you know it might suit you. And I think um, talking, getting in touch with 
whether it be the Aboriginal, um, local Aboriginal organisations, um, there may be some homeless support area. Um, uh, it could be um, migrant and refugee support services um, or even a disability support. And, but it's actually to get to know who, who is actually in your area and in your domain. And firstly, those organisations themselves may have people that um, actually are interested and willing to uh, actually be representatives, representatives and advocates. I would definitely begin by finding who those groups are, finding out what they do and getting in touch with them. It's definitely about working through what it already exists within the community rather than start scratch. And so the, the, the um, sound just came in and out there a bit, so I'll just repeat the main message from Serena around getting in touch with the local people in your community who are working with, with marginalised groups. And really this is one of the core of what um, we hope can be achieved through ground up engagement by partnering with the community, finding out what's there um, and again as Serena says, finding out and targeting those local groups who are working with or already connecting well with uh, marginalised uh, people in the community and connecting with them. I'm aware of time and that we've only got a few minutes left and we might not, I'm afraid, be able to get to all the questions. But we've had um, a question about um, the guiding principles and values um, that underpin the, um, the model. Some of that's actually answered in the, the report um, that will be released very shortly. But um, it's also, I think, important to recognise the guiding principles and values of the organisation and how they link with, with engagement. And Serena, just in the couple of minutes we've got left, I was wondering if you could just, just touch on that around our values and the guiding principles that we've mentioned underpinning the, the model. Look, um, uh, and I'm talking from memory, but the, the different examples that I've seen, it really establishes um, the, the ground rules for, uh, for interaction and it tends to be around um, trust, um, clear communication, you know, working together in good faith, um, uh, being aware of conflict of interest, and um, uh, and that engagement will be meaningful. Um, that it's not that it's not tokenistic. That uh, that they actually to consume and do something with with the work they do or the or what they the advice they provide. It yeah. tends to be that. That sort of, um, that in, a, in a way, they're almost motherhood statements, but they give a fun. This is the way we, and it allows um, allows to organise the you know staff and management and, and in consumers to say, look, we agreed we work together this way. Um, you know, let's make sure that we're you know we're sticking to that. No, look, that's that's great. Thanks. Serena, and as we said, a lot of uh, those questions and, and many more are answered, I think, in much more details in the report that will be um, available soon that brings together the evidence that's behind the model um, and we'll be sending out information and links to that to everybody who's on, on the, the um, webinar. Now, look, I'm aware of time and I think unless there's any more questions that people want to sort of put in now and pop up, in the next minute or so, we might end it there. I can see a few people who are sending their thanks, um, which is fantastic. And thanks to everybody who's joined in. This is our first webinar, um, so we'd be very interested to hear from you about your experience of it. Please fill in the evaluation that you'll be sent um, shortly, because we'd like to hear how what we can do better. Uh, I'm quite excited that uh, Health Consumers New South Wales has been able to do this and also around such an important topic. And again, I'd like to thank everybody involved, but particularly Serena um, and the hard work that she's put in. Um, I want to acknowledge and thank Serena. So thanks everybody. I can see
Um, more thanks coming through. That's great. I'm glad people appreciated it. And um, I think we might call it a day there. But um, thanks, everyone. Unless, Serena, you've got some final words? I just um, appreciate that everyone came to the webinar. Thank you. Thanks for those who've actually lasted through to the end. And, and uh, yeah, look, I, I really would love to hear how it, how it goes. We'd love to get feedback on what you think. And if, you, if you're using it, we'd love to hear what you think. Thanks again. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks so much, everybody. And we'll, um, we'll be in touch soon.